In the dawn of time and life in the universe, Karak, also known as the first tree of knowledge, was planted by the creator, keeper, and guardian of time and space. From this tree, life in the form of the demigods was created, and the one known as the Great Evil was also an offspring in the Karak. He was the smallest out of all of his siblings, and the very thought of that angered him. Out of rage and jealousy, he rejected the very thought of existence, declared life a pain, and sought to destroy everything and all of reality. He started his conquest first by devouring the essence of his siblings, killing anyone who refused or tried to resist his powerful might, until he achieved enough strength to go against the Creator. With the essence of his siblings now in his possession, he vowed to destroy the tree, the Creator, and creation consume or subjugate all other gods to his will, and name himself the King of Darkness below. All who witnessed the Great King's conquest offered close to nothing in terms of resistance. No man nor god could stop the Great Evil. Although he had all the powers needed to take out all of the creation, it still didn't feel enough. He wanted more, but no other besides being himself could give him the essence he desired. So, his best bet was to create more of an essence through the offspring of his subjugated goddess, Sanna, who he forcibly made his wife, and with whom he served seven daughters on. But unfortunately for Sanna, she died shortly after giving birth to them, which led the king to take all seven of her daughters as his new brides. The great darkness was so powerful that even the darkest of demigods fell to his will. While the older deities agreed to follow him, among which was Jesser, Goron, the Hangman, Moloch, the White Wolf, and the Unseely Queen, at the time no one knew his real name. Even now, we still don't know who he is. But all we know is is the great evil is in fact the one we now refer to as the Scarlet King. Greetings my friend and welcome to probably the Foundation's most complicated subject, SCP-001, who also goes by the name of the Scarlet King. Oddly enough, throughout the history of humanity and existence itself, he has gone by many names, some of which are the Great Evil, Harak. Ninth Hagar, King of the Darkness Below, Shormash Ardell, Crimson Khan, Red Shaha, the Crimson Monarch, the King Who Rose From, the Bleeding, Lord of the Throne of Despair, Defiller of Words, PTE 616 Mendez X Machinia, the Red God, SCP 2317K, and of course, SCP-001. The subject belongs to the Keter safe class. I'll explain what I mean by that later. So, moving on. The subject's special containment procedure is as directed by the recent investigations of Dr. Robert Monotuck suggest that the Foundation is not required to take any action in regards to the subject's containment, further stating that SCP-001 is functionally self-containing and there is, in fact, an interface in this self-containment. The result could be the end of humanity. Dr. Monotuck also advised that no one should be given any authorization to engage in matters related to SCP-001, with the exception of some SCP anomalies already in Foundation containment that are some what related to the subject. Reason being, the sent person might be misled by the Scarlet King to reveal the truth about his containment. A truth. The Scarlet King must never know the benefit of mankind. His request was granted, with the exception that only members of the O5 committee were allowed anywhere near his supposed containment. Although Dr. Monotuck was tasked with finding out everything there is to know about SCP-001, he, however, wasn't really able to give a real description on what or how the Scarlet King looked like. The only information he could get were all either from assumption, past history, History or his brother's dreams, in which he described the Scarlet King as a red humanoid-like entity, one of immersed size with a crown on his head which signifies royalty, considering the fact that he calls himself the King of Darkness below. And although he isn't certain of the description, it does make sense considering that the name given to him has a word closely related to the color red as in crimson, and a word that is related to royalty. He also stated that SCP-001 currently exists in several alternate dimensions simultaneously, but he's also however unable to enter the prime dimension. 
At least, that is what he believes anyway. However, despite the fact that he can gain entry into our reality at any time he so wishes, it is believed that the Scarlet King has made several attempts to gain entry in the last 300 years, which prompted him to the belief that he can only gain entry as summoned by beings in that reality. So all he has to do is wait. In my opinion, we should all be grateful for whomever or whatever gave him that idea because it basically bought humanity more years to at least figure out what we are up against. And though the entity isn't in our prime reality, its physical and mental properties still have a strong influence on a number of individuals and events within our reality. The Foundation has also kept knowledge of SCP-001's existence away from anyone below a level 4 personnel. They do so by giving everyone the idea that SCP-2317 is in fact the Scarlet King as a means to downgrade the threat level of the subject and also to somewhat contain the grief. Although the hypotheses insist that there is absolutely no way SCP-2317 is anything more than a single aspect of SCP-001, the truth of that belief remains unknown. And despite the large amount of data I managed to get my hands on from the SCP Foundation, I wasn't able to get an exact date of discovery for SCP-001. At first, my best guess was that the data was destroyed during the 1889 Snarling Coup, along with several archives worth of data concerning the SCP Foundation's origin. This reason alone could have been a major setback in the tracking of various timestamps on when he was first sighted. But after looking through several other investigations on this subject, I no longer see that as the case. Why, you may ask? Well, considering the fact that the SCP Foundation didn't until recently consider him worthy of an in-depth investigation makes me believe his discovery was more recent. Another important piece of information I found had to do with the recent rise of some occultic groups who have tasked themselves with the sole aim of bringing the Scarlet King to our dimension. It is also a possibility that similar groups have existed for years even long before the discovery of the SCP Foundation. It could be that they are all descended from one another. Some of these groups, like the Children of the Scarlet King and End of Time, have already made their intentions known to the SCP Foundation. With the most recent of these events occurred in January 2018 with the Children of the Scarlet King, but fortunately, their efforts was elated by a joint operation between the Global Occult Correlation and the SCP Foundation, by which the leader of the group, who goes by the name Depesh Spivak, was captured and placed under the SCP custody under the designation POL. 3172. After several interviews between Dr. Monotuk and POL 3172, the Foundation concluded that even though the rituals performed by followers of SCP-001 seems rather occultic in nature, they however pose no real threat to humanity. Looking back at recordings between Dr. Monotuk and POL 3172. Do you know why I'm here? I don't know, so tell me, why are you here? You and your group made an attempt to bring SCP-001 to our dimension, and I want to know why. We didn't make an attempt, we are just following the tradition of our cult. Are you trying to say the group before you is the main source of the connection between you and SCP-001? And the group before them. <laughs> and the group before them. <laughs> And so on, and so... So you think this is funny. Extinction of the human race is suddenly a joke to you. You call it extinction. I call it salvation. One that with or without me. My family is going to make happen. Immediately after this interview, Dr. Monotuk requested that the SCP Foundation treat these groups as a serious threat, and they must all be found and contained. His request was declined in the end, shortly before the SCP released their statement insisting that the group is a level zero threat to humanity. A few months after the capture of POL-3172, Dr. Monotuk reported to the Foundation that his brother went missing. 
claiming that he feels the children of the Scarlet King are behind it. He also claimed that there could be a possible link with SCP-001 involved, but his report was dismissed under the note that the Foundation cannot waste valuable resources for a missing person's case. Contact your local police after 48 hours have gone by. Out of sheer grief and anger, Dr. Montauk sought to take out his revenge on the Scarlet King in the only way he saw possible. Procedure 110 Monotuck. On paper, Dr. Monotuck claimed the procedure was a means to keep the Seventh Bride or SCP-231-7 from having the Scarlet King's child by making use of a means to stop her from existing. But in reality, the project itself is an inhumane and brutal experience for anyone. After seeing the procedures with my own eyes, I honestly don't think going into details would be necessary. But the bottom line is, it was effective. This whole ordeal, although it was a bit traumatic for me to handle at first. But after accepting these facts, some questions did prompt in my head. First of all, why exactly did the Scarlet King or his followers kidnap Dr. Monotok's brother? Well, to answer that question, I need to know who he really was and if he somehow had relations with the SCP Foundation. Though some strategic means and sheer luck, I was able to get my hands on the answer to all of my questions. Dr. Monotuck's journal. This was probably one of the biggest source of information on SCP-001 that I've ever gotten my hands on. It also contained three valuable pieces of information necessary for my investigation. The first being the probability that the Scarlet King was created through the dreams of Jacob Monotuck, who is in fact Dr. Robert Monotuck's brother. The second had to do with the Seven Brides, Procedure 110 Monotuck, and why it was stopped. And the third talked about SCP-2317. It also contained details of some previous experiments, including SCP-001. This actually brings us back to why it was also regarded as a safe class. It's based on the results from the investigation done by Dr. Monotuck himself. Because you see, for years following his discovery, the Scarlet King has been dubbed probably the greatest Cutter class member in history. But after the investigations done by Monotuck, the Foundation and the O5 Council both agreed that the Scarlet King will not be able to break the rift into our reality. And as long as no one tells him the truth about our reality, then there really is no course for alarm, so they think. Technically, all I can deduce from this whole policy the O5 Council passed an SCP-001 is they are basically accepting the belief that what you don't know won't hurt you. But in this case, I'd say our survival is based on a 50-50 chance that the Scarlet King figures out the truth for himself. Till then, all we can do is hope. And of course, let's not forget about the followers of the Scarlet King and Jacob Monotuck's involvement in this. Could he be a crucial element in the Scarlet King's entity? Or has he been the missing piece all along? I'll need more time to answer these questions, but while I'm at it, I'll need your help answering these questions. What do you think about the Scarlet King? Are his followers as dangerous as Monotuck claims? Leave your thoughts in the comment section below. Like this video and subscribe to my channel if you wish to see my take on the subject. Where is he? The genesis of all creation is the beginning of time. This was when an all-divine being known as God created all of space and time. But his main focus was on a garden so beautiful that it is considered paradise. And in that garden lived the first man and woman. But after disobeying the creator by eating from the first tree of knowledge, also known as Karak, the creator banished them from the garden and closed the gates. But to prevent them from ever making a return to the Garden of Eden, he put two angels and a giant flaming weapon at the entrance of the gate to keep watch for all eternity. Times change, seasons came, the Scarlet King was born. Evolution was a must, otherwise it turned to dust. To keep up with the change in events and the advert of the Scarlet King, these two angels needed to evolve or get destroyed by the great evil and evolve they did. By grabbing the weapon simultaneously, a huge ball of fire came down from the heavens and engulfed these angels, creating what we know now as SCP-001, or the Gate Guardian as proposed by Dr. Clef.
Welcome, my friends. My name is Detective Nicolette, and as always, I have another interesting subject to show you. The story you just saw is a mere depiction of how Dr. Clef identified the true SCP-001 and how it was made. The Foundation dubbed the subject as a Euclid Keter class for specific reasons, which I'll get to soon. Currently, no real containment procedures are needed for SCP-001 because of its nature and it is located at what we know to be Site Zero, a location only known by the current SCP administrator and the single overseer level agent of Abrahamic faith condemned O5-14. Despite no need for containment procedures, the Foundation did, however, order a 24-7 monitoring of the subject in case of a change in behavior. In the event that the SCP-001 becomes active, the said agent is required to immediately alert the administrator and every other overseer level agent, as such an activity from the Gate Guardian could be the beginning of a Patmos XK class end of the world scenario. SCP-001 is a humanoid entity who is measured to be approximately 700 cubits in height, located in a classified location, but data suggests that somewhere near the the intersection between the Tigur and Euphrates rivers. On its body, we can clearly see a number of luminous wing-like appendages located on the shoulders, temples, back, ankles, and wrists of the subject. Despite all the necessary efforts to put into counting these wings, no real number has been given, but most observers assume the number of wings to be somewhere around 2 to 108 with the most common number being four. The entity also wields a weapon, possibly a sword or a knife, which we will now call SCP-001-2. This weapon is probably the most interesting part of SCP-001. It emits flames at a temperature that rivals even that of the sun, at least according to spectrographic analysis. At the surface, the sun measures a temperature of about 5,505 Celsius, 10,000 Fahrenheit, while its core was measured to rise up to a temperature of 15 million degrees Celsius. Now take that temperature, multiply it, and we have SCP-001-2. But strangely enough, the weapon doesn't seem to have any destructive effect on the surrounding area despite its intense heat. However, it could seem that the weapon does act as a defense mechanism for the Gate Guardian. Despite the entity remaining inactive, the sword, however, strikes down and obliterates any entity that comes within a one-kilometer radius of the subject. Several attempts at closely inspecting the subject via remote control robots and drones proved futile. Despite the drones making it past the one kilometer mark, they were all destroyed by SCP-001-2 shortly afterwards. In the event that a hostile action is taken towards SCP-001, the end result was a complete annihilation of the attacker, regardless of the range as proven in a test conducted by the SCP Foundation on December 26, 2004, which nearly exposed the Foundation to the world. In this test, Yes, the SCP Foundation fired several nuclear ballistic missiles at the Gate Guardian from an SCP Foundation submarine called Nautilus. But to their greatest surprise, the missiles detonated even before getting to its target, killing a total of 35,000 people in the process. And Nautilus was immediately destroyed, killing all personnel on board. The Foundation was eventually forced to terminate the family and friends linked with the 35,000 deaths to prevent questioning before the deployment of amnesthetics on an almost global scale. After this experiment, the O5 Council put a ban on all experiments involving both SCP-001 and nuclear warheads. SCP-001 from observation appears to be in a standing position with its head bowed in a gesture, a supplication, while SCP-001-2 is held with both of its hands pointing downward in front of it. It has maintained this stance ever since its discovery years ago without a slight deviation. If a human were to be exposed to SCP-001, they begin to hear voices like a whisper. They say certain words which they cannot disobey in their head, with the most common directive being forget, which makes the person walk away, losing all memory of their encounter with the subject. But on rare occasions, other words are heard, like in a particular experiment involving a D-class employee tasked with approaching SCP-001 as closely as possible on foot. But on contact, he reported hearing the word leave in his head, and without looking back, he immediately turned away from the entity and left. Despite repeated orders to go back and continue the experiment, the Class D personnel refused to obey, which led to his termination. 
Division. But shortly after his termination, the entire staff division in charge of the research were immediately obliterated by an unknown force which we can assume to be SCP-001-2. Not even SCP-076, aka Abel, nor Task Force Omega-7 obeyed the command of their superiors after they were given the order to leave by SCP-001. When asked why it refused commands, SCP-076 simply replied, no just no after this particular result. The SCP Foundation decided to carry it out with the help of SCP-073 or Kane as he is called. But despite all his abilities, Kane was left unconscious while multiple members in charge of the test were left permanently blind. After this incident, the O5 Council ordered a stop in all experiments carried out on SCP-001. However, the most famous word ever used by SCP-001 was the word prepare, used on the founder, to which he claimed was a call to action by the Gate Guardian to find and contain all supernatural and paranormal artifacts that could pose a threat to the current existence of humanity. This is the organization we now know as the SCP Foundation, but if you were to take a look at the language used here, at first, does look quite straightforward to some, but to others, like myself, it is confusing because it implies there was an already existing set of humans before us. But after thinking it through with a cup of green tea, I think I understood what he meant by all this. But in order for you to understand what I meant, you first need to know everything about the entity and why it is in existence, which is what I'm about to tell you now. In recent years, observers have noticed what looks like a gate of immense proportion right behind SCP-001. Through long-range photography, SCP researchers were able to detect some elements of pastoral grove within the gate, which contains other entities that bear a striking resemblance with SCP-001, as well as several unknown fruit trees. Dr. Clef and two other observers brought three major findings and hypotheses to the table. But this data were all expunged from the SCP database. Well, so they thought. After looking at the case note, I found the IDs of the two other gentlemen that brought up these two hypotheses, and it would seem they both still work at the Foundation, while Dr. Clef was declared missing. On seeing these men, I tried tricking them into telling me all they knew about the Gate Guardian, choosing my words very wisely as to not attract suspicion. But to my greatest surprise, neither of them knew anything about an SCP-001 subject called the Gate Guardian. My best guess is that they were given a level 2 amnesthetic the moment they presented their hypothesis on SCP-001 to the Foundation. Left with little options, I decided to ransack Dr. Clef's former office for anything of value. I had almost given up until I saw a note pop out. Office Foundation Watch. On the paper, he wrote a lot of things like how he warned his two colleagues about revealing what they found. But most importantly, he also wrote about their hypothesis on SCP-001, which made me understand why their memories had to be wiped. The first part was on two fruit trees on immense proportion located at the center of the grove. The first tree looks like a regular apple tree, but the second bears a fruit unknown on Earth. From their observation, they claim that this second tree was bigger than the first by about a meter, which means it was probably the first tree in the grove. Taking a footnote from our story on the garden, that tree is best known as Karak, the first tree of knowledge. But taking a footnote from our first video on SCP-001, Karak is in fact the birthplace of the Scarlet King. The second part of their hypothesis had to do with the grove itself. There they believed that the gate itself, which SCP-001 protects, might actually be the gates to the Guardian of Eden at least based on correlations with the ancient Babylonian texts and the Dead Sea Scrolls. The third part was on the identity of the Gate Guardian, and their belief was that it actually might be Uriel, a deity in charge of bringing evil to its knees. But perhaps the most interesting part of this note was the mention of Jacob Monatuck, which in fact, now that I think about it, actually makes sense. You see, the purpose of the Gate of Guardian, besides protecting the supposed Garden of Eden, is to lead to the war against all evil in not just our reality, but every reality in existence according to the take the gate opens. 
This tale plainly states that when the time comes, SCP-343 will give the order to the Gate Guardian to open the gate from it. His angelic army will come out to take out the evil in existence. This is clearly a direct declaration of war against the Great Evil, also known as the Scarlet King. He is, after all, the author of several deaths and destruction across all reality. But don't forget what I said earlier. From what the Guardian said, the SCP founder must contain all threats to the current existence of humanity. It was a long stretch, but I actually came up with a hypothesis based on what he said. Recall, the beginning of existence and creation started with the first tree of knowledge, Karak, which is the birthplace of the Scarlet King, who, as we already know, declared war on all creation. So my theory is the Scarlet King has indeed destroyed the first ever created timeline in all its realities, which is why from observations, the Grove has a second tree of knowledge, which bears the fruit of a tree species we are are aware of. Although this statement is a long stretch, it does explain why the Gate Guardian felt it needed to warm our current existence to impeding danger. However, it doesn't actually explain what all these had to do with Jacob Monotok. But I do have a theory. If in fact Jacob Monotok is actually gateway of some sorts for either the Gate of Guardian or Scarlet King, then he wasn't kidnapped by the children of the Scarlet King. Rather, he is in Dr. Clef's custody. My best guess is Jacob Monotok is either the gateway Way for the Scarlet King to come into our reality, or he is the key needed to open the gates and let loose the war on evil. Either way, Dr. Clef might have actually done humanity a favor by kidnapping Jacob Monotok, because despite claiming not to care about him in reports to Dr. Monotok, they were fully aware of the importance he holds in the mystery surrounding the Scarlet King. I can't say for sure how accurate these theories are, but I do plan to look into these proposals more. So what do you think? Is Jacob Monotok directly link with both proposals? Did Scarlet King actually destroy the first existence? Share your thoughts in the comment section below. Like this video, subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you in the next one.